I'm recording. This meeting is now being recorded. Um, guidelines are make space, take space ratio. So just being aware of how much space you're talking versus listening and allowing others to speak up, to be respectful of one another and our differences, to not interrupt, to stay on topic slash focus on the topics relevant and assume good intent of all who are here. So our agenda tonight is um, introductions. We started with um, us at SVBC, and now we're going to introduce our panelists and moderator tonight for this very special event. So we have our moderator, uh, Vignesh, Vignesh Swaminathan, um, CEO and president of Crossroad Lab, also known as Mr. Barricade um, on TikTok, if you follow him there. Um, and Vignesh, is there anything you'd like to share right now about yourself? Um, well, uh, I, we started Crossroad Lab about four years ago, mainly focused on paving projects and quick build projects. And over the last four years, we've built over 75 miles of roadway in, uh, as, our, as, our, as our new firm started in the Silicon Valley. I'm from the Silicon Valley. I grew up in Sunnyvale and Cupertino. Um, and uh, our Mr. Barricade channel has uh, 1.3 million followers with over a billion views where I talk about active transportation and help enable citizens and, and community members and, and city staff on how they can actually make uh, structural change through active transportation. Awesome. Thank you so much. And we're really happy to have you. Our panelists today in order of presentation are going to be John Brazil. He's a transportation options program manager for San Jose Department of Transportation. John, is there anything you'd like to add or anything you'd like to say? I'm just happy to be here and, and learn from everyone. Thanks. Awesome. And next we have Jessica Manzi, the transportation manager for the city of Redwood City. Just excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Great, excited to have you. And Sergio Ruiz, Complete Streets Coordinator for Caltrans District 4. Hi, also happy to be here and glad to see some familiar faces. Great. Um, so for the next about 20 to 25 minutes, we're gonna launch into panelist presentations about the different ways that they handle restriping, repaving plans in their municipalities. Um, and then we'll jump into a Q&A with all of you. So please, if you have any questions, um, write them down in the chat or, or write them down for yourself to ask later. And we'll hand that over to Vignesh to moderate that from about 5.30 to 5.50. And in the last 10 minutes, we'll close, thank everyone and transition into our breakout rooms for our local team meetings. All right. May it begin. So first we have John. And John, just let me know when to click next slide for you. Thank you, Chelsea. Appreciate it. So happy to be here and share some of City of San Jose DOT's experience with building bikeways in our restriping and restriping during our repaving program. And so I want to say up front that we're still after doing this for eight years, that is building bikeways with our annual payment program. We're still figuring things out. And so it's not a perfect system. And I look forward to learning from the other panelists and folks on the call as well. So next slide, please. Here's a brief outline. I'm gonna give a simple overview of uh, the program. When I say the program, I mean our annual bikeways program that we implement primarily through our department's annual payment program then give a brief case study, talk about some challenges. Because as I said, we don't have it all figured out. We're still working on it, trying to improve the process. And then lastly, just make a couple suggestions on how you can help. Next slide, please. So the city of San Jose has, as most cities do, a repaving program where we resurface a certain number of streets every year. Um, we have 2,400 miles of streets in the city of San Jose, and we repave about 200 miles a year and spend around $90 million just to repave streets. So about eight years ago, my management said, this is a great opportunity for us to build our bike plan um, instead of building on-street bikeways separately. Let's implement them when we can with the repaving program. And so we took advantage of that and began doing that about eight, eight years ago. I included a, a URL for a public 
public facing web page, you can see the screenshot of it here. You can uh, go there if you want and drill into some maps and see what our department's annual payment program is about. It's kind of a fun place to dwell for a little while. So we, our department has a three-year payment program. What that is, it takes a look at a bunch of variables uh, that I won't drill into, but the condition of the payment, which streets are most worn out and lots of other variables and says, okay, in the next three years, we want to pave these streets. And it's a, it's a rotating three-year schedule. So it helps us plan moving forward. And so we can look at that and say, well, our bike plan says we want to put a bikeway on this street or improve, enhance a bikeway that's already there on this street. We can plan ahead looking at this three-year paving program. Next slide, please. If you do go to the website, there are fun maps to drill into. Here's one where you can see the three-year uh, paving program, what's planned for three years. There's another page where you can look and see uh, what streets have been paved when. Um, and I encourage you to go there if you like to geek out on that stuff. Next slide, please. So program overview, by program, I mean the bikeways part of it that my team works on, you know, designing, funding, doing outreach for, and coordinating with our payment program to build bikeways according to our city bike plan. And we've done uh, probably 200 projects. Some of them are easy because they don't require any changes in the street, but I wanted to give you a sense of the ones that are more challenging where we're taking a street and saying, hey, our council approved bike plan says we wanna add a bikeway where none exists and we're gonna pave that street, but we don't have enough space to fit a bikeway. What are we gonna do? Well, there are two things we do. One is a road diet, which is sometimes called a lane reduction. It takes lots of analysis, and traffic impacts, and uh, lots of planning. Uh, but in the last uh, 12 years, we've done 31 road diets. And also another way we create space on streets for bikeways is to repurpose on-street parking spaces. And again, over the last dozen years or so, we've had 55 streets where we've uh, repurposed parking. I say repurpose, that means remove on-street parking. We don't do this willy-nilly. There's lots of analysis that goes into uh, how much what the utilization rates are during peak hour of the parking spaces we're proposing to remove, and also whether there are nearby alternatives. But you can see we've removed over 3,000 spaces of on-street parking to complete, to uh, add bikeways according to our bike plan. Our old bike plan that was approved in 2009, I think, we completed the 400 miles there. Last year, the city council approved a new bike plan. So we're now building out bikeways on that through this pavement coordination. Next slide, please. A brief case study. Uh, some of you probably have ridden on 10th and 11th Street. Um, again, how do we create? So, so the city was planning to pave that street. Um, and originally, before 2012, the shot on the left is pre-2012. There were three lanes of traffic with on-street parking on both sides. So in 2012, we did a lane reduction, but our management at that time wasn't supportive of protected bikeways. So we had this buffered bikeway with just paint between the cars and the bikes. That's the middle slide. And then in 2020 and slash 21, it was being repaved again. And we said, let's do something better. This is a unique example of a kind of a hybrid uh, bikeway, which is kind of like a service road on the side a local access road with physical separation um, between the bikes that share the local access road and the main travel lanes. And so that's a brief case study. Um, there are lots of pros and cons and challenges with that that we could talk over a beer about, um, but I wanna make sure there's time for the other presenters. So next slide, please. Here's a quick screenshot of what that latest version of 10th and 11th Street looks like. And you might've said, well, why don't you do a protected bike lane instead of this local service lane that you have to share with cars going in and out of the driveway? The reason is because there wasn't enough right of way or space in the road to fit a protected bike lane because of the frequent driveways and the required sight lines. So this was a hybrid that actually has worked relatively well and we're learning from it so we can improve upon it in the future. You can see the raised curb separating the main traffic lanes where traffic is usually going 35 to 40 miles per hour. And then in this to the right, it's just only lo local traffic that would be going to a house on that block. 
So that means there's very little traffic in the space where the bikes are. Next slide, please. If you're interested in learning more about this project, there's a website about it. Again, there's a long URL there that uh, talks about it a bit. Uh, it's 95% it's done at this point, um, but there are also other projects at that Move San Jose website that you might be interested in looking at. Next slide, please. So um, some of the kind of challenges and lessons learned, there were a, a lot in this particular instance. There's a bus route on this corridor, and so we had to figure out how to fit a bus stop um, while we're reconfiguring the street. Um, as I mentioned, driveway access was actually not rationally a challenge, but whenever you change streets, uh, some people freak out and think the world's gonna come to an end. And so we had to comfort people. I remember one neighbor who said, I have a, a speedboat that I have on a trailer and I pull it in my truck in my driveway and the, this is terrible. I'm never gonna be able to bring my trailer and boat uh, in and out of my driveway anymore. And we showed him that, yeah, you can still do it. Don't worry, change is not always bad. Things like that. And then these are expensive, particularly with the bus stops and the uh, changes to the bus stops. So it's not easy. There's lots of complexity. Again, could talk over coffee or beer at another time. Uh, next slide, please. I'm going quickly so that I wanna make sure everybody has a chance to present and to talk and ask questions. So brief summary of some of the challenges, not all. Where do you put your trash bin, your recycling bin, your yard waste bins when you're doing any kind of bikeway? There isn't a really good answer for that, particularly on busy streets that have a lot of car parking turnover or that have no space for car parking. You don't wanna block the sidewalks, so that's a challenge. Frequent driveways I talked about. Curbside demand is a broad description of anything that wants to use the curb space. Parking might be one example in a downtown environment. There are lots of delivery trucks that are double parking or parking in bikeways, potentially blocking them. TNCs, those are things like Uber and Lyft who are temporarily parking and often blocking a bikeway if it's not a protected one. So managing curbside demand and designing for it is a challenge. Public safety access, whenever we're changing the street, particularly with infrastructure like a protected bikeway that puts something physical on the street that wasn't there before, police department and particularly the fire department can sometimes have concerns. We have to bring a 10 ton fire truck down the street and now you're slowing us down or you're narrowing it or there's not as easy access to the fire hydrants. So to work out all that. Outreach and equity is another huge conversation for another time, but how do we make sure that we're uh, serving well traditionally underserved communities um, and folks that have been uh, not well represented or don't have a voice? How do we make sure that we're hearing them and giving them things that they want or at least don't oppose um, and giving them, empowering them is a big challenge, giving up power to help them with decision-making on projects like this. Funding is always a challenge and generally opposition to, ch to change is a challenge. O&M means uh, operations and maintenance. So when we're building bikeways and things like protected bikeways in particular, remember that a protected bikeway is something where you put something physical on the street to separate you and cars. When you put something physical on the street, that means the bikeway is narrower and a traditional street sweeper can't fit. So I'm just gonna share real quick a shot of um, a custom street sweeper that we purchased. And even it has challenges sometimes to uh, sweep some of our protected bikeways. This protected bikeway was designed before uh, all the designers got the memo on, we need seven feet clear width for the sweeper to fit through. So, you know, how are you gonna maintain and sweep your protected bikeways? And this is one solution. Again, another fun conversation for another time is I went out with uh, our sweeping crew to uh, on a ride for one of their weekly sweepings of protected bikeways. I didn't know that the shift started at midnight, but nevertheless, I had fun. So I'll stop sharing that and ask for, let's see, let me see. How do I stop sharing? Sorry about that. Just a minute. Sorry, I got lost in my screen here a bit. Let me go back. Can you guys see me okay, the screen okay still? Yeah. So I can't see my, my uh, PowerPoint, but if you guys can, I'll go to the next slide and you can tell me what that is. So we're at the end of your PowerPoint. 
Perfect. Thanks for your time. And sorry for the rapid fire, but I want to make sure others can talk too. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Sean. And we'll move right along to Jessica and her presentation. And I just want to check in. Can everyone see the, the screen um, starting with Bike to Vist Forum Redwood City right now? Yep, we got it. Awesome. All right. Go ahead, Jessica. All right. Thank you. And thanks, John. That's a great introduction to the opportunities and challenges of implementing bike facilities with repaving projects. And um, I'm glad that you touched on all those challenges. So I don't have to, to go into so many of them because, uh, you know, we deal with those same issues in Redwood City. Um, but now I'm going to share the perspective of a smaller city uh, in Redwood City. And just to give you a little um, a sense of how we compare to San Jose, we have roughly 150 miles of roads and San Jose has 1,500, so about a tenth of the size. Uh, as mentioned, I'm Jessica Manzi. I'm the transportation manager, and my team in Redwood City is responsible for managing Redwood City's transportation network, uh, which includes our pavement management program. So next slide. Um, so I want to just talk through the sort of janky um, flow chart here just to give you a sense of how we do, um, how we manage our streets. Um, so the very first step in the process does start with regular inventories of our streets to establish the pavement condition. And this information is fed into an asset management system that we call Street Saver, where information on the pavement condition, um, cost of different maintenance treatments, uh, as well as our anticipated budget are used to come up with um, our five-year paving plan. But it does that in the absence of you know, any sort of understanding of the real world. And so at the staff level, we have to go through and sort of refine that five-year paving plan, sort of the optimized uh, five-year paving plan based on the roadway conditions and costs and um, ground truth it with what's going on in the real world. So you know, we're always coordinating with utility companies who come in doing projects, um, our own, um, utility programs, putting in new sewers, uh, new storm lines, new water lines. We have to coordinate with if there's development projects that are that are anticipated. Um, and then also keeping in mind whether um, there are projects that would require that repurposing of space like John was talking about, where we need to anticipate, we need to plan for more time for a planning process to happen. Um, when we're trying to you know coordinate with, particularly with other, um, utilities, it's really important for us to, um, to do that in a way that's, that's mindful so that we're not putting on fresh pavement and then they're coming in the next year and tearing it up to put in a new sewer line. Um, or the sort of the converse example is if we know that a, a development project is either definitely happening or could be happening, um, we may want to pull that street segment off of our paving list and let the development pay for it. So we can stretch out our paving dollars a little bit more. Um, so we use that sort of real world ground truthing to help develop what would be like a, pave, a list of specific streets for our next paving project. And when we get into that level of detail, um, we're looking at how those streets compare with our adopted plans to see if any are identified for either new um, facilities or upgraded facilities, uh, as well as talking to our transportation advisory committee for input on um, whether there are locations on those streets that are particularly problematic or that would benefit from modifications. Um, and then we can use that information to uh, adjust the designs so that ultimately we're building better bike lanes. Bumper. So next slide. Bumper. <laughs> uh, so uh, like John, I'll just share a couple of case studies um, and you know, like he outlined, when you're making big changes, that typically comes with a, a big process. Uh, so this is an example of um, a road diet that we did on Farm Hill and Jefferson, where, you know, we identified that uh, a paving project was coming up and, hey, isn't that a great opportunity to try out uh, a road diet? Um, but that ultimately came with, you know, a whole series of community meetings, a lot of analysis implemented as a pilot that was evaluated going to and from, you know, city council multiple times. So it's definitely um, an effort that you have to plan for in advance. And, you know, ultimately this did push out repaving work um, so that we could do this. Um, but ultimately we were able to, to implement this change um, which is ultimately has been uh, much safer for the community. 
So next slide, please. Um, this is um, Marine Parkway, which is in Redwood Shores in Redwood City. And it's just an example of, of types of modifications that we actually do at the pretty much at the staff level and where um, we can use input from you know, residents and people that work in Redwood City and our transportation advisory committee on, you know, where, you know, additional tweaks are needed. But um, something like this, you know, what we're doing is we're looking at existing travel lanes to see if we can narrow them so that uh, we can widen the bike facility, um, converting uh, standard, well, in this case, we didn't do it, but in, in some cases, we'll upgrade crosswalks from standard crosswalk markings to high visibility crosswalk markings. Here we added cross bikes as well as, you can't really see it at the, the far edge of the intersection, but we added bike boxes as well to, to facilitate turns um, off of Marine Parkway. Um, and then, you know, things like adding sharrows or shared roadway markings is something that we can do again at the staff level that doesn't um, require some sort of community process to go through. Uh, next slide, please. And then these are just another couple of uh, images of other modifications we've made on recent projects, as well as my contact information if anybody has questions. Um, so Twin Dolphin, so Alameda uh, is the street on the left. And this is actually a case where we were able to add um, some bike lanes that didn't exist already, um, largely because there was already red curb um, in place and didn't need any parking removal or reduction in the travel lanes to, to add those facilities. Um, and then Twin Dolphin on the right is actually a case where um, we have a class one path that runs along uh, the street, um, but particularly commuter cyclists, it's not a very, it's not a convenient route. You're going up and down. Um, and frankly, the path isn't in the best of conditions. So. Uh, we took the opportunity of the paving project to, again, we could just narrow the existing travel lanes down uh, to put in a, a totally new bike facility, uh, but didn't have to remove a travel lane in order to do that. So um, every time I'm out there, you regularly see cyclists that are biking through and riding on the street in the bike lanes rather than using the, the adjacent path. So that's uh, repaving projects and bike facilities in Redwood City. Thanks. Awesome, thank you so much, Jessica. And next we're gonna welcome Sergio Ruiz. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Sergio Ruiz. I oversee our relatively new Complete Streets program at Caltrans District 4 covering the Bay Area counties. Uh, and so my focus will be on our state highway operation and protection program, um, otherwise known as the SHOP, uh, which covers all of our paving projects that we fund and deliver. Next slide. Um, so just a very brief overview of, um, we've had a lot of policy and guidance updates related to uh, what we call complete streets, uh, which is you know uh, looking at active transportation and transit as a priority and not just moving vehicles. Um, we're currently in the process of updating our complete streets policy, which will play into how we deliver our paving projects um, every few years we update our strategic plan and there's been a big focus on multimodal transportation in our most recent update. Uh, and then we have an executive order um, from the governor to leverage our transportation funding to help reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And a big part of that is um, promoting and supporting active transportation. And then I don't know if, uh, if some of you are aware of CAPDI, which is a, a new initiative from our state transportation agency to really emphasize uh, reducing vehicle miles traveled and supporting other modes of transportation. Uh, next slide. So there are a lot of actions as well uh, around complete streets. I won't go into these in detail given uh, seven minutes, <laughs> but um, uh, feel free to Google these if you have time. It's a lot of great information on all, a lot of the activities that Caltrans is doing. Uh, we've also completed uh, district level plans, uh, a bike plan and a pedestrian plan was recently completed. And these are happening across the state uh, for all 12 districts. Next slide. So going back to our shop, um, this is primarily uh, our, our main program that Caltrans has control over funding. Uh, it's a two year programming cycle, but 
uh, and then there's a 10 year planning cycle and they somewhat overlap. So it's a little bit confusing, uh, very different than how cities roll out their paving programs. Um, but we do have a lot of assets and some, some of them have targets tied to them um, and we have different objectives as well. Um, next slide. So just an example from our 2022 shop cycle. So this is our two year cycle is every even year. Um, 2022 shop. These are projects that were recently programmed, but are still in development. Uh, we recently implemented what we, what's called a complete streets decision document for each project, where um, we actually have to document uh, complete streets scope that's included in all of our shop projects. And where we don't include the identified uh, pedestrian and bicycle needs, we actually have to justify not including them. So it kind of reverses the the paradigm of you know, before we would have to get exceptions to try to add um, walk and bike facilities. Now it's the other way around. Um, it's also helped us track what um, we're including in all of our projects so we can better quantify um, what we're doing. So just for this two year cycle, we're adding quite a bit of new sidewalk uh, and bikeways as you can see listed here. Um, and these will definitely be refined as the projects get developed. Um, some of these numbers might go up or down a little bit depending on what's feasible. Uh, next slide. So, uh, and then another new thing for, and this is referring to our 10 year um, shop plan, otherwise known as a state highway system management plan. We actually now have performance targets for complete streets. Uh, and what we, what's counted toward those targets are crosswalks, sidewalks, and bikeways. And they're counted as linear feet of, of each of these uh, types of elements. So each district now is tasked to meet certain targets um, for the 10 year shop and, and that in turn gets applied to the, uh, to the two year cycles. Uh, and so this will start with our 2024 shop cycle. Um, so these are projects that have not been funded yet, but we're currently in the process of identifying these projects and scoping them out. Uh, and so it's gonna really change the way we do business um, within Caltrans. Next slide. So um, I'm gonna skip through this, but there's a really helpful link if you want to look at what our 10 year shop uh, looks like. Uh, it's basically a, um, it's an online system where you can look up projects um, and you can filter by location, which ones include bike lanes, things like that. Um, but for, in the interest of time, uh, I'll go to the next slide to go over some example projects. Uh, so this was recently completed. Uh, this is down in Gilroy State Route 152, which includes First Street, Monterey Road, and Leesley Road. Um, I would say that the city's Bic Bicycle Pedestrian Commission played a big role in, in pushing for these improvements as part of a Caltrans paving project. Um, and it was completed in the last year. Next slide. Um, so these are some in development. These happen to be in the North Bay, so outside of the Silicon Valley Bike Coalition jurisdiction, but um, we're looking at definitely transforming these highways that run um, sort of as a main street through through a couple cities uh, along State Route 12, where we're rep repurposing some of the roadway to add um, buffered or separated bikeways. Um, and these are still in development. Um, for these, I would say that the, the city of Sonoma played a big role in, in the one on the left. Um, the one on the right uh, in Rio Vista, uh, the county has been a key partner and a community group has helped organize and push for these improvements. Next slide. Um, we also obviously state high highways uh, are made up of a lot of freeways as well. Um, the opportunities look a little bit different in terms of um, looking at complete streets opportunities. Uh, these paving projects typically end at the ramp intersections, so we look at the ramp crossings for potential opportunities. Um, they're limited to the existing geometry, though. We can't really square up ramps as part of paving projects, but we could enhance crossings or reduce lanes potentially uh, to help minimize conflicts. Next slide. Um, and then here's a short and maybe not complete list of upcoming pavement projects in your area. Um, some of these are fairly challenging. Some of them, we see some great opportunity. Um, my time's almost up, but um, I'll just say real quick that um, it's been a lot easier when cities have streetscape plans or if we just have full support from the city on, on specific concepts that we can kind of take and, and hit the ground running in developing our projects. 
Um, otherwise, you know, it's, we, we can work through the project development process to try to come up with uh, solutions to try to improve walking and biking. Um, but even with um, El Camino Real, which is, you know, one state highway that runs through so many different communities, um, it tends to look very different in, in these communities. So we see very different challenges and sometimes opportunities. Um, but I, I think working with Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition has been very helpful in, um, in kind of coming up with a consistent um, approach in terms of what the desired um, results should be, even if we can't always meet that with some um, paving projects. Um, so I think we share some of the same goals for sure. Um, and then Woodside Road is another one that's going to be paved soon. We're working with Redwood City for some opportunities um, to improve biking along that corridor. Next slide. Uh, and then uh, outside of paving projects, um, we do have some safe, our, a safety program that's kind of wrapped into our shop. So that can provide some other opportunities um, to provide uh, new bike facilities. These are two examples. Um, Kind of a first for Caltrans to initiate projects for separated bikeways that were initiated because these locations saw a higher con a concentration of bicycle related collisions. Um, so these are still probably two, three years out, um, but they're, we're just now in the beginning of developing these projects. So another exciting opportunity to come. Next slide. So that's it very quick i'm uh, happy to answer any questions and happy to join the discussion thanks thank you so much sergio uh, and thank you all and now we're going to move into a q a so i'm going to hand it over to vignesh to moderate um and and we'll answer all these questions in the next 15 20 minutes Thank you, thank you uh, uh, Chelsea, and uh, thank you all to our presenters uh, for for being very thorough and 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 in fitting as much as you can in these in this quick in this quick time that we have. Um, I also thank the presenters for answering some of the questions already in the in 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 the in the chat. I'll I'll uh, um I'll skip over the questions that are unanswered and we'll we'll, we'll go through the ones that are um that are still outstanding. Um, question comes from uh, Leah. Mel, Mel, Mailman from Sunnyvale uh, asking about specifically the 10th Street project. This is, the, I believe, is directed to John. Um, do drivers cheat the local lane usage? Um, well, first of all, I also want to thank Vignesh. He has done some excellent consulting work, his firm at the City of San Jose and some of our downtown projects. Thank you, Vignesh, and your firm. And uh, secondly, um, we don't see a lot of cheating. Um, we haven't formally gone out and done multi-hour observations, but so many of the folks in my department live in that area, work in that area, and bike it. And uh, because the fact is, it, it's going to be slower. Why would somebody go over into that that side service lane? It's gonna they're gonna have to slow down. They're gonna have to watch out for driveways, and so there isn't really an advantage. So that's our experience so far. Um. Cool. Thank, thank you, John. Um, yes, working on the Better Bikeways project was a lot of fun uh, working with you guys. Um, as somebody who's driven on 10th Street, I've tried to cheat in that lane. That you can't cheat in that lane. Um, it, it, doesn't make, it doesn't work. Um, uh, could, could, could we ask homeowners in a very kind way to not use up the entire bike lane with yard waste? Maybe there's, they're not aware that it creates hazards. Have there been any campaign for that, uh, John? Yeah, that's one, I agree that's a challenge. And what we're discovering as we investigate more is that because San Jose is so big, it has multiple different contractors who in different parts of the city pick up yard waste recycling and garbage. And those contracts tend to be seven plus years long. And what's written into some of the contracts where what we call unbundled yard waste is allowed um, it says you don't have to bundle your yard waste. And that's because it's a contract, we can't amend it. We have to wait for the contract to expire and then try to amend it. So we're working on that uh, with each contract as they come up. Yes, I remember we dealt with that in the, in the Better Bike Waste project where there was multiple com companies with different types of units to how they pick up the trash very differently uh, throughout, throughout the city. Um, a question from Gabby Landaveri. Uh, could we get a street sweeper attached to a bike? Is... 
Is there well, anybody? <laughs> I'll just chime in my two cents. Uh, the street sweepers serve a specific function that's regulated and they have to include certain things, uh, which I don't know all the details, but things like the ability to spray water and uh, sweep up certain types of debris. And it would be possible on a bike. I think though the bike would need a power source and a significant power source to be able to achieve the purposes and the requirements of street sweeping, but possible. I, I do remember in my experience of going to many conferences that I actually was approached by a company who was experimenting in that, uh, in that realm of, the, of a trailer. Um, and I'll also give a side note that on, on, on the platform I use TikTok, there's a lot of different types of people that, that post in the platform. And there's, there is actually a bicycle cycle track street sweeper account where they just go and they talk about all the different things that they see in the, in the bike lane. And then he gets out and he looks at uh, what, what's out there and wonders how did they get there. And so it's very interesting to see all the different perspectives in short form video. Um, moving along, uh, I see a question from John Kayon. Um, from what to what did they narrow the travel lanes? And I believe this is a question for Jessica uh, here. Um, Jessica? Sure. So um, basically, we regularly will reduce travel lanes to, to 10 feet. Um, on Twin Dolphin, we had um, an existing four foot shoulder and a 10 foot travel lane and an 11 foot travel lane. And so we took one foot from the existing 11 foot and added it to the four feet to make a five foot bike lane. And it, just to clarify, it's against curb, it's not against uh, next to parking. Well, thank, thank you, Jessica. Um, we, we've, uh, we have another question here from Taylor Pope Olds from Redwood City. What sort of justifications are being made uh, when, when they are, are left out? And I believe this is about the uh, um, uh, about the different decisions that have to be made of cross bikes and 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 more when when making these tough decisions. Yes, yeah, specifically referring to uh, the comment that now there have to be justifications leaving out pedestrian and bicycle improvements instead of the other way around. Well, this is John. Uh, cost is once in a while a factor, and I think that's even in the the definitions of the new requirements. That in some rare instances, if the cost to include certain types of facilities is over a certain percentage of the total project cost, then it's a, I think it's possible to exclude it. But that's not something we come across often. Usually, it's a challenge of space in the road. Um, and because we've done the easy bikeways in San Jose, most of them, now it's a matter of, well, geez, this car has 40,000 vehicles per day, two lanes in each direction. There's no space for a bike lane. If we remove a lane, it's going to be backed up for miles. And so that, those are some of the challenges we come across. Um, yeah, there are many compromises when we have to go through this different design. Um, I believe that question was was uh, was for 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 Caltrans. Actually, my apologies. Um, is 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 when you're doing your 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 assessment of different projects, how do you justify which projects are left in and which projects are left out? Um, sorry, I was respond very engaged in the chat or trying to respond to some of the overlapping questions. Um, can you repeat that very quickly? <laughs> Um, I believe it's 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 uh, uh, when 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 looking at uh, assessing and funding different complete streets projects, uh, what what are what are some of the, the the major I guess justifications for leaving some projects in and leaving some projects out? I see. Sorry. Um, so right now, it's a lot of it is just based on opportunity with um, where our paving projects are being prioritized. Um, we do have a finite amount of resources. So we sometimes do refer to our bike plan and now our pedestrian plan. If we have to start prioritizing, you know, we can invest this much in complete streets and this paving project versus this much in another paving project. And this is done in, at the district level. So over across the entire Bay Area. Um, but for the most part, it really just depends on where our paving projects are. And that's where, where our focus is on. Um, and then through our work with a lot of our uh, key stakeholders and county partners, 
we generally know which corridors tend to be higher priority. Um, like El Camino is is a huge focus, and so um, if we see any opportunities on El Camino, we'll definitely push for that. Uh, that, made, that makes a, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, where to prioritize paving projects because we spend so much money on paving anyway, and so a lot of times these paint and post and other types of uh, types of uh, different different geometry is is just a drop in the bucket compared to how much we're spending on on paving. Um, right. so it makes a lot of sense. Um, is there any consideration to change the name uh, to uh, so it doesn't include the word highway um, and focuses more on transportation uh, overall? Um, I think that comes from like not focusing on on movement of car vehicles, but just movement of, of people. Yeah, uh, we're pushing for the term state transportation network. Um, however, state highways and the state highway system is uh, encoded in law and guidance and, and many different sources. So it's kind of hard to change the name just like that. Uh, but when we're talking about the highway mainline itself, we'll say state highways. If we're talking about all of the facilities that include walking and biking uh, along Caltrans owned um, jurisdiction, it's the state transportation network. And, and it, this kind of leads into the next question is uh, El Camino is still designated as a, as a well, or was it designated as a highway in, uh, for many, many years? And are, are there plans for, what are the plans for the bike enhancements on El Camino Real? Um, we've had the Grand Boulevard Initiative many, many years ago. And, and uh, kind of what are some next steps that you see uh, when working through all these jurisdictions? Um, so I, I can start and maybe, I don't know if any of the other reps here might have anything to add, but, um, we're kind of still working within the framework of how highway projects typically get funded um, that's been around for a while and we're just now starting to change that um, but like even with our paving projects for example um, we usually don't have a paving project that extends more than two three four miles at the most and even that's already a pretty large significant project um, so we don't really have any funding source at least at caltrans has control over where it could, we can cover the entire corridor um, across two counties. Mm -hmm. um, that said, you know, there might be opportunities with some SB1 programs um, in the future if either the region or a county wants to, to lead something that covers multiple jurisdictions. Um, but yeah, it, it does remain a challenge. Yeah, the El Camino is a is a tough cookie uh, to tackle just because there's so many different land uses and so many different uh, agencies. And, and uh, uh, um, so, uh, yeah, I, I feel it. Um, uh, this question from Ari Feinsmith, um, which projects do you add bike lanes, uh, which pro projects to add bike lanes require public outreach and analysis? And then this can kind of go answer be answered by anybody uh, here. Um, so it's typically, typically if you're having to remove a travel line or a parking line, that's where we need to go through some community process to make sure everybody's on the sort of the same page, analyze what the potential impacts would be and the benefits, and uh, come to kumbaya mm -hmm. consensus. It can be very yes, challenging. It's the same in San Jose as Jessica described for Redwood City. Yeah, and it, similar it, for Caltrans. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no go ahead. Yeah. Um, Similarly, you know, we pre historically relied on, you know, what CEQA requirements or, you know, going through the environmental process, what what type of environmental document requires formal public outreach. However, given that we're trying to include more complete streets and paving projects, we are trying to at least include some informal engagement and outreach, um, even, even if we're not foreseeing any environmental impacts. Um, but that's been a slow, challenging process in, on its own. Yeah, you hit it right on a nail on the head is in terms of what the environmental uh, process are. And, and in my experience, uh, whenever we have to take away a lane or if we add more impervious area, then it, it triggers something in SQL for us to do. And the SQL process requires outreach. And so, um, uh, and, and so whenever we do a lot of bike lane projects or quick build projects, we try to avoid adding more impervious areas that can be swales or widening or, or, or uh, uh, more like that and, and, and do what we can within the curb to curb width. Sometimes we've gotten away by cutting the gutter in half, and we did that in Cupertino, which is kind of a kind of a workaround. Um, but there, there, is, there, is, there is ways to uh, not trigger SQL. Um, what does support from uh, from cities mean? 
how can SVBC local teams help with this? In Redwood City, uh, they're with, interested in El Camino Real and 84. Sorry, can, can you repeat that real quick? Sure. Yeah, what, what, the, what does support from cities mean? How can uh, activists oh. with the Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition local teams help with this? In Redwood City, they're particularly interested in safe bike lanes on El Camino Real and Highway 84. Yeah, so that, that was one that I was trying to respond to through the chat, but I'll, um, mm -hmm. uh, support can look like very different things depending on, on what it is, but it could come in the form of a streetscape plan that a silly city develops. Um, sometimes Caltrans actually funds planning studies to develop these uh, streetscape concepts that call for specific improvements. Um, or it could happen at the city council level if, if a council member or representative calls for certain improvements and puts the pressure. Um, it could just come through the project development process where um, we, we do engage with cities and, and ask for city feedback. Uh, uh, and so having the support come out that way um, although it, we're trying to do that earlier in the project development process when it's not too late to add certain things late in the design phase. Um, and then also, we would definitely need city support if it's something like uh, parking removal or evaluating potential uh, lane reduction, if that's even possible. Uh, we typically defer to the cities uh, on, on street parking so that the city would have to be um, give a, approval through their city council if that were an option. But uh, you, you answered a couple questions there. You also again, kind of answered a kind of question by Ken Kirshner, Kirshner, who was asking about how, how what advocates can can do uh, when one of the things on El Camino Real. And I think that is working with the city on the parking removal and also uh, being part of uh, the streetscape and other type of projects uh, that, that, that that occur doing paving and, and capital improvements. Um, for the sake of time, I'm gonna skip around a little bit in terms of the, in terms of the questions. Um, uh, is is anyone measuring, and this is for anybody, is anybody measuring pedestrian level of service? And uh, I think for the highway capacity manual, pedestrian level of services has to do with the width of sidewalks and how, how long signal timing is at certain corners for accumulation of people at those corners. Uh, but that's based on the highway capacity manual and there isn't a lot of uh, uh, and better analysis tools uh, outside of that. Yeah, in Redwood City, we typically don't do a lot of pedestrian level of service analysis. It hasn't been a super effective tool. I think we were more focused on uh, gap analyses mm -hmm. um, rather than a, sort of a straight up LOS analysis. Yeah, I find in San Jose, PLOS is a uh, very labor intensive, data intensive, and the marginal value there, there's definitely some value in the POS, but it's very, you have to collect and obtain a lot of data to input, and that's kind of burdensome at a city level. I do find at the kind of CMA county level, for example, with VTA, or at the regional MPO level, with MTC, they tend to use those tools a little more. Then that makes a lot of sense, like especially in an area like downtown where you may want to do pedestrian level service. It probably just makes sense to get rid of the push button and just always have the, the walk sign on, um, like how San Jose has done in their downtown. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, um, removing the moving of a travel lane and removing of street parking are typically unpopular. Um, and uh, I guess usually the majority of community members oppose it. How does essentially, essentially uh, uh, how does the city essentially stand up to that opposition and make change? Uh, which is a which is a tough question that a lot of cities uh, we will we will struggle with. Um, so, is there any key strategies that that different cities have uh, that that San Jose or a Redwood City have used to kind of help uh, gel that conversation with the community? You can go first, John. Did you say I can or you will? You can. Oh, thank you. Well, uh, so the question was about the community, but first I'll mention the, uh, the electeds because they're the ones that take all the heat. When the project goes in that somebody doesn't like, they get all the phone calls. And so we always work in early on in the planning phase and the analysis phase to and share information with uh, city council members it's a delicate balance because technically 
our city council does not have to approve land reductions or parking removal. Our department director can, but we really include them and try to make them fully understand the impacts. One thing that helps a lot is with council and also the public. And there are going to be people that aren't happy, but if you can start up front by pointing to a, a city plan that is approved by city council that says our goal is to, for example, build these bikeways or get more people biking or make it, make it safer, then people may hate it, but there's, there's what's guiding us. The council told us, approved a plan that said do this. Um, and so you can't make everybody happy, but it's good to point to policies. Yeah, and the only thing I would add too is, is safety is a strong motivator too. Uh, a lot of projects will be on the, uh, the heels of um, you know, safety challenges. Um, but I think also being able to point to, you know, a lot of uh, bike projects do provide benefits for everybody and being able to highlight the benefits um, you know, specifically with the road diets, if you're doing a road diet on a residential street, there's a real benefit to the people that live on that street that they can pull out of the travel lane and wait for a gap in traffic in order to pull in, a, in and out of their driveway. The bike lane can give them more space to maneuver in and out. So um, on the Farm Hill project, you know, often it's, you know, one-on-one -on -one conversations with those residents, but those can be compelling reasons for people to support things. And it's, it is surprising sometimes in some ways that um, you can get much broader support for these projects than you would necessarily assume. Um, but yeah, good, good go point. Um, when you're done, could I add one thing? Yeah, okay go for it. Were you done, Jessica? Sorry. Yeah. I agree with everything you said. Also, I'll point out that, you know, we don't, outreach is not a check the box thing. We're more and more trying to do outreach early enough so we can actually hear the co concerns of the public and then go revise the plans to try and address the concerns of the public. And so some projects will have two, three, four meetings and even two, three, I don't know if we've ever done four iterations of plan revisions just in response to the public input, for example, to minimize parking impacts. And while they still may not be 100% happy, they're a lot less unhappy when you've actually listened to them, responded and tried to mitigate the impact. And just tagging on one last thought is, you know, in terms of what, you know, all of you who are listening can do to help. I mean, starting participating in these planning processes from the very beginning is super critical because, you know, if we're at the point of taking a plan to the city council to approve, you know, to put out to construction, it's pretty late in the process to expect significant changes to the design. We can always, you know, there's tweaks that can be made after that fact, but really you want to be part of that planning process because, you know, we're making decisions about design early on and then tweaking and refining those, those design, design decisions. So um, it's hard to go back to the fundamental design of a facility um, late in the game. Yes, uh, in the end, um, uh, uh, and this, this, is a this is the last question. Uh, uh, that, that was the last question because of our, our, our sake of time. But I will also add that uh, what, I, what, I've, what, I've, uh, what I've had a lot of experience with is having very different conversations with different types of people about the project. Um, where where the, it, we may not want to talk about it as a lane reduction, parking removal, and bike project. We may want to talk about it like Jessica mentioned as a as a as a road diet that's actually going to be helping people turn, or maybe talking to fire department about what they can run over, or talking to the 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 the, 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 um, the um, landlord of a multi-family property about how they're going to deal with their dumpster and how that's going to be better for them, or crossing safety. And so having very different projects from a complete streets perspective actually can help. Uh, gel well with a lot of these communities, um, rather than uh, using some of the terminology that may trigger uh, 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 things in, in the in the community. Um, uh, because at, at the end of the day, there's so many different types of people that use the street, and they all have their own different connections to it. And uh, 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 and and we can get the benefits of a lot of these things just by by having very different conversations with different types of, uh, of users of the roadway. Um, but with, with that, uh, th thank you all. Uh, thank you all for uh, thank you. Thank you all to our uh, our panelists here uh, for the thorough experience and sharing that with, with all of us. And thank you all for all the very, very, very good and detailed questions. Um, the, uh, these these are questions that we all struggle with as we go and we implement these in different communities. And uh, it takes advocates like yourselves to also be enabled in having these conversations like Jessica mentioned and coming to the meetings and being participate and being and being knowledgeable about what the different objectives and constraints are 
uh, to actually help us get to a better tomorrow. So thank you all. Yeah, thank you to Vignesh for moderating and thank you panelists again for being here and so many great questions tonight. It almost seems like we should do a part two. <laughs> um, and we're gonna just transition now into some closing announcements from this part and then move into our local team meetings for the six to seven o'clock hour. Um, so here are some upcoming events that we have uh, this month and next. So we have some upcoming team rides, uh, San Mateo Bikes Giving Ride and Food Drive, the San Jose Team Fall Bike Ride and the Palo Alto Group Ride to the Highway 101 Pedestrian Bridge Bicycle Bridge opening. Um, so those are all on November 20th and you can sign up here on these Eventbrite pages. On December 4th, we're going to have a social ride at William Street Park in San Jose as part of our programs team. Uh, that ride is going to happen from 11 to 1 p.m. and you can register here on this event right hopefully another member of staff will be dropping these links in the chat. Um, as we mentioned in the chat we're having an open house also on December 4th so that ride actually ends at our open house, uh, which starts at one and we're going to be showing our new office to our community um, it's going to be a fluid event from 1 to 4 p.m where you can drop by any time and come check out our new space, connect with our staff um, and offer your own visions and, and ideas for SBBC moving forward. So you can register here on Eventbrite. Um, there'll be food and beverages as well and uh, prizes, I believe. Um, we have our first Saturday Eastside Connect Farm Box by Bike delivery um, program in the next First Saturday is December 4th at the farm. So if you're interested, you can sign up to deliver some farm boxes by bike or just ride along um, and watch another member of our community do that. Um, and you can sign up, hopefully someone to drop that in the event break too, or in the chat, sorry. And our next Spectivist Forum will be on December 8th. Um, so it's gonna be actually the second uh, Wednesday of December rather than the third, just due to holidays. Um, so we're shifting that to be a week earlier on the 8th from 5 to 7, and the topic will be national transit justice. So you can register here. And uh, thank you again for being here.